Oh man. Ah oh, boy. It's one of those days. Chiggs asks, what time does Khalil come on? That's a great question, Chiggs. We're gonna talk about that soon. <laughs> oh man. Guys, guys, guys. Well, hey! All right, so here's the good news and the bad news. The good news, I'm here with you. The bad news, Khalil, not yet, but he's close. Khalil is like, you know, you know when you're, you know when you're uh, meeting friends at a restaurant and your friend texts you and says parking, and you're like, oh, okay, so they're really close. It, it's we have the the stream equivalent of that. Khalil's not parking. He's on his way. He's actually here. He's actually so we we started a couple minutes late today because he's having a few uh, tech issues going on right now. In in the aim of bringing you guys uh the best uh, possible location for him to do his thing um he's he's in a friend's studio and um anyone here who's gone into somebody else's studio it's like i don't know like putting on someone else's shoes or something like it's just no that's not the right metaphor what's the metaphor it's uh it's different it's things aren't where you have your things and things aren't working so uh so he he hit me up and he said he's having a little problem getting uh, jacked in his audio jacked into the studio. So he's he's working on it, and then then the dominoes start falling. His trackpad's not working. His computer's slowing down. So anyway, my point is he is he's getting himself set up. He'll be with us soon. And until then, it's you and me. So how have you guys been? This is no different. We've done these before. I could do this. Uh, I could do a whole hour of this. Not that you guys would be enormously let down by uh us promoting dj khalil and you getting dj uh ryan the disappointment so but um he'll be with us shortly I, now it's gonna be you know a lot of times i bring the guest on before the stream so that they're kind of just waiting in the wings and i bring them. it's all so seamless and polished and but today's gonna be a little you're gonna see a little more of the process of getting him on the stream because once i see him pop up on zoom over here then i'm gonna we're gonna bring him on and uh, we're going to have to do a little bit of that setup talk that you guys don't, don't normally listen in on uh, while, we're, while we get them up and going. But let me tell you, here's one thing about uh, our guest today, DJ Cleo. He is worth the wait. And, and you guys who know him know that's true. So, but until then, you know, in fact, actually... Stefan sent me some questions that you guys have been sending in. I don't know where those are coming in from. I'm going to take a look. Where is that coming in? Is that maybe Instagram that people have been commenting or something? I'm not quite sure where Stefan's getting his source of questions. But he sent me like, I don't know, it must have been, you know, 50 questions already that uh, has been coming into him via messages. And um, I looked over some of them. And so first of all, I... I want to field questions from you guys in the chat, obviously, priority to the people who are tuning in live. i got to support my my crew here. But um, there are... <laughs> Amelia Polo says, banjo riff, please. Totally. I, I could just sit here and just play the banjo and like, soon he comes. Um, but um, yeah, no, I want, to, I want to give you guys in the comments a chance to sh send in your questions, talk with Khalil live. Uh, and, but there's some good ones in these pre-sending questions that we're going to get as well. And there are also some ones that I thought maybe we could go through while while Khalil's getting set up here. We could go through and I could actually answer maybe some of those, not with his answer, obviously, but the ones that I probably wouldn't wouldn't ask him directly um, because I want to get you guys in the comments. So I thought maybe we could look at some of those and um, and then otherwise we can just kind of hang out. I'm, I'm curious to know. Tell me in the comments. How have you been? What have you guys done? I sort of, you know, have this wonder about you guys. Each week, I think, I wonder I wonder if they're working on music too. I worked on a bunch of music this week for a thing I can't really talk about yet, but you'll know about that soon. Um, that, that was what we call in the stream business a tease. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, I was, uh, I was doing a lot of uh, music making this week, and I hope you guys were too. Tell me what you guys are up to. And particularly, I'd love to know if anyone is 
trying things that we've covered on the stream. So like, for example, we did the, uh, the songwriting week with Olivia and I wonder if anyone started doing what she was showing where you, you take a triad and you kind of add coloration with the other hand and kind of make the chord more interesting or with, uh, Jesse last week, we did, we talked about these clusters and how you can take these kind of dense chord clusters and actually use them either to create kind of tension and mood, but also how you can then base all your lines. You can build up a whole idea by sort of moving through these clusters. So let uh, people know if you, in the comments and let me know if you guys have been doing stuff with that, I would love to hear kind of what's going on there. Um, Ian asks, Ryan, am I in the process of renovating my studio? Do you see, are, are you catching this? Is that what you're catching? I am in the process of renovating. Is that, I might, Ivan, I'm going to give you the Eagle Eye Award this week if you actually correctly noticed a little bit of uh, plastic wrap and a piece of wood laying against there. Um, I I am in the process of renovating my, my studio. One might also call it my office. One might also call it my apartment. <laughs> but um, I, I'm getting a, a desk, or I got a desk. I just haven't put it together yet. So it's it's sitting over there and in my hallway and, and all that stuff. Um, look, I'm just going to kind of answer some questions here on the fly before I jump into some other stuff. Um, and, and Ivan, I, I, if we, if I, if I need more time here, I'll tell you about what I'm doing with my, uh, studio renovations. Cause they're actually pretty neat. Um, Ryan, how do you learn to create vocal harmonies on the fly? Uh, that is such a good question and such a question that's kind of in my zone uh, of recent is it's maybe the most recent thing I've learned musically in terms of like major music, major musical skills that like two years ago, I didn't, I couldn't do at all. And now I can do. And, um, that answer, Ashley is probably more than I could give you a good answer right now, but I'm going to, let me uh, vaguely attempt to actually try and give you an answer. Um, should I, how should I do this? Let me think. Okay, wait, should I, should I get a guitar and do, maybe I'll, uh, I don't know. I'm, I'm not sure. You know what? I almost think like maybe that I should do a stream where we cover that. Cause it's like a whole topic unto itself. Let me give you the short answer and I won't grab a guitar unless I'm really, <laughs> if I'm really vamping for time, then I might grab a guitar and we'll, we'll do it right now. But, um, the answer Ashley to how do you create vocal harmonies on the fly is a kind of a two-part answer. The first part is that usually, mostly, let's keep it simple and not get into kind of advanced kind of fancy harmony. Let's just talk basic harmony. The harmony chord, or sorry, the harmony note is going to be in the chord that's being sung. The melody note is almost always going to be in the chord that's being played underneath it, and the harmony notes you will find in that chord too. So let you know, or maybe we'll grab a guitar. Hang on a second. Hang on. We got to grab it. Okay. No, I'm not getting the banjo. No, no, no. Okay. Let's see. Let me, I got to get a pick too. Okay. So, um, okay. So let's say we've got this chord and what key am I? I'm in B. Okay. So we got a B. And let's say I'm singing uh, this note. Da, do, 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 do. There it is. Do, 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 do. Right, okay, that's my melody. Um, that is a, that's the fifth of the chord. That's the D. Like my chord is, that's my triad. And if I wanted to sing a harmony on top of it, I just need to go cycling through that one, three, five triad, that major triad, one, three, five. I just cycle through and I sing the next chord tone that is above the uh, the note that I'm singing. And in this case, that would be uh, the G again. Do, 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 do. So if I'm singing the, oh, oh, wait, wait. Khalil's coming in here. Hang on a second. <laughs> it's the weirdest start to a uh, uh, a producer like Khalil. But um, you know what, <laughs> Ashley? We're going to say I'm going to answer that question in more detail in a stream. And I am seeing... Khalil off to the side. Let me put my guitar down for a second. That did not sound like a good crunch on that guitar. Hey, Khalil, how you doing? Are you, uh, you're getting in there? Things are good. Yeah, yeah, It's, uh, working through some technical issues, but I think 
I think I got it. Think things are running? Okay, let's do yeah. some. <laughs> I told these guys that uh, when when we get you on, we're gonna they're gonna see a little bit of and hear a little bit of my setup process that normally we do before the stream. But so they're all keen to just kind of listen in here while I get you set up. Here's the first thing we need to do um, is to make sure that you've clicked that button in the upper left corner of the Zoom call that says um, turn right now probably says turn on original sound. And yeah, and if it should, if it says turn off on the screen, that's what we want. Okay. Good. Okay. Um, and then the next thing uh, for you to do would be to uh, go ahead and share your screen. And I think things should still be set up from last night when we tested. So, because you're still using the built-in output and all that. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yep. So go ahead and share your screen, and then beautiful. All right. All right, guys, we're close. Um, let's. Can we just play any old sound just to make sure we got some sound from you, and then we'll. Beautiful. Okay. Beautiful. Okay. So now we'll get to that stuff in a second, but before that, let me. Um, let me go ahead and pin your video. Okay, there we go, guys. Okay, now I'm going to now rewind the tape here. It is, uh, <laughs> let's pretend it is 10.02. We've just come into the stream and uh, I'm going to bring my guest on now because uh, I'm, I am excited to have him on. I know you guys are excited to have him on as well uh, because just the volume of sort of pre-hype for this stream of people sending in questions, people commenting and, and kind of the buzz that's been going on for this one has been pretty pretty huge and with reason because i don't mean reason the program i mean for good reason because my guest this week is he's sort of i mean he's a legend in his own time i don't want to like totally just you know fluff his ego too much but but god damn it he is uh, when you run down his list of credits it is like a, a who's who of the last 20 years of 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 hits you know i'm gonna just throw i'm gonna throw some names and then i'm not giving you all the names i'm just gonna throw out sort of some, like some top headline names ever heard of eminem drake kendrick lamar jay-z dr dre nipsey hustle 50 cent aloe black pink snoop dogg cypress hill red man pitbull and celine dion is that really true <laughs> I saw that and I thought, well, wait a second. We're going to talk about all of those things, how he got into music, how he got into Reason, what he does with it today, because he is sort of the modern day Reason story. Ladies and gentlemen, can you please welcome DJ Khalil? Say hello. 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 <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, Thank you so much for joining us here. So I, I told Khalil when he got on the stream uh, just a, a before that we went on, just to let me know that he was having some some, some plug issues. Uh, I told him that his lighting game, he might win the best lighting award now for <laughs> anyone in these I streams. Can't, I can't even take credit for it. Shout out to my boy Brian Morgan. I'm, I'm, this is this is his spot. So he's got the crazy lighting. I'm trying to figure it out right now. I'm like adjusting all that good stuff. I know it's Shout good. Brian Legendary Brian Morgan. Yeah. Well, so how are you doing? I, I guess you're now you were in the throes of um, trackpad troubleshooting, but now you can sort of come back into the the more chill mindset of uh, yeah, 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 <laughs> music yeah. and stuff. But yeah, uh, uh, I'm good, man. I'm good. Just just staying creative, you know, um, learning a lot. That's really like I've been taking all this time to just learn as much as I can um, just diving into everything reason ableton every you know every dog for the most part i've been i've been learning in everything so never stop learning right right hey you know what let me just uh, a request uh from stefan who runs our uh, remote stuff in yeah. stockholm um we should bump your mic up a little bit could we we can just do this on air a little bit uh, low rent here could we go to the zoom preferences zoom preferences. yeah in zoom preferences um well, actually wait maybe we could do it actually in the sound just the built-in system preferences Okay. Um, and bump that up there. That probably that might be the better way to do it. Yeah. Input. Okay. Yeah. Input volume. Yeah. Is that better? That is probably better. Yeah. That sounds better on my end. Let's hope that okay. works out well. It's always one, somewhat two, of an two. unfair. Uh, the guests always have sort of a, a webcam mic, and then I've got you know the studio mic running through a compressor. And <laughs> right. It's like the loudness wars is a is an unfair advantage for for me. <laughs> but um, well, so yeah. Now, what I think is kind of cool about 
Well, there's a lot that's cool about your story. And I want to kind of talk with you for these guys kind of and, and get people up to speed. Uh, you used to present. In fact, the first time I met you uh, was at a NAM show and um, you were presenting at the Reason booth and you, you were telling your story. And I thought it was such a cool kind of at the time, it was a, such a cool story of kind of where tech and music and the industry was at at the time. You were sort of on you had come through what was the uh, cutting edge of sampling and and hardware based production and then at yeah. the time this is probably uh, mid 2000s you were on the cutting edge of this second wave of sort of i don't know like nouveau sampling or faux sampling or whatever and we'll talk about that but right but i wonder if you could kind of tell us a little bit about kind of how you got into music production in the first place and that first era of uh, hardware that you were kind of getting into yeah um like my first piece of gear that I got was an ASR-10, um, and I bought that in college. I used to I used to make beats in my friend's house. I had a friend um, who had a studio. He put a studio in his garage, and you know I'm a part of a group called Self Scientific. Um, you know we we put out an album in 2001, and we put out several albums, and you know we're kind of like a critically acclaimed underground group. Um, but that's kind of like where we started was was uh, at at our friend's ho- uh, you know garage. And he had like a he had Cubase and like a S950, and that's where I really first started sampling, taking all my dad's records. Like my dad is a huge jazz head, so I used to take like, re- you know, just like boxes of records over there and sneak them out, and then go over there and just sample. And I, that's where I kind of like learned early on. And then when I went away to college, my junior year, uh, you know, I flew to New York, and then I, I uh, my cousin was like, yo, you should go to Sam Ash and, you know, just go, you know, I saved up money and I just went and I bought ASR 10. I shipped it back to Atlanta. I was going to school at Morehouse and, um, and, and I was just making beats every day. I was studying, making beats, studying, making beats. And like, and, you know, just studying Pete Rock premier, you know, during in college, like Jay Dilla, that was like the emergence of Jay Dilla. And that was like, right. My mind you know, um, to hear what he was doing. So I, I just, I just wanted to go even harder just to try to even get, you know, anything that I was making to sound like his, uh, or that good. So there is something, uh, you know, that, that era, I think for people that didn't live through it, it's kind of hard for people to even understand, uh, two things. One, just how sort of primitive and limited things were back then, but also the flip side of that, how creative that made people you know, because you're trying to make the most you can with what you have. But like the ASR-10, yeah. I mean, it, it had what? Not a ton of sample memory time on it, right? Yeah, you could you could bump it up. You could put, I think you could put like, man, it's been so long, but you could put like um, like more RAM into it. Yeah. So you could, you could increase your, your sample. So you could blow out your ASR-10. Then you have like an output expander so you can like track all your stuff like separately, all your drums and all that stuff. So you could you could upgrade it. But, you know, back then it was like you had that and it, you know, you never really used like their stock sounds like, you know, their stock sounds weren't like hip hop, you know, like, right. You know, great for hip hop records, you know, in my opinion. So you bought modules. So I bought like an MS 2000. I had a Roland 3080. Uh, I had a Waldorf Q. I had a Virus B, you know, so I just started like buying all this stuff because I would see like you know, producers like, you know, obviously like Dre or whoever, you know, you'd see maybe pictures in the studio if I ever, you know, would, would visit a studio, I would see all these different modules. So I started buying that. Um, and then I have friends that, you know, that were producers too. So they were, they would put me up on stuff. Right. So, you know, but, but it's different because you can't save it. Like, however you're making it, you have to kind of like, and you had to like either print it to a tape, like when you, you had to like literally record it live to a tape or to a CD burner. So back then it was like a performance, you know, I'm like doing the filters live, I'm doing everything. So when you place the records and they're like, yo, you know, we got to mix it and it doesn't sound anything like what I did on that CD. It's, it was a huge, huge problem. So you would so make the when, demo, you'd make a demo live to CD and yeah. then, and then it would, someone would want to develop it and it would be like, wait, 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 why doesn't it sound like the, like the demo? Yeah. Why doesn't it sound like the demo? Like, why why isn't this lead happening right here? Or whatever? And I'm literally doing everything live at the time, and you just can't save it that way. You know, at least I didn't know how to do it. You probably could program it, but <laughs> it 
my skills on the NSR were pretty minimal. I just wanted to get the beat done and like, you know, and have like a few different changes in the sequence. And I was right. Like, but recording live, I had no idea how to do that. Right. So, yeah. So that, that was like a, a huge obstacle for me. Like I, even with G unit, um, on beg for mercy, lay you down. Like, they ended up using the two track because we went and mixed it. I separated it and all that stuff. And 50 got the mix and he was like, we can't use this. It sounds nothing like the record that we had. So they used the two track on the album. Huh? And the, two, and the two track, if you listen to it, has so many like mistakes and different things, but he loved that part of the, you know, of the, the way it sounded. That was like a part of the sound. Right. So, so they, they just like chopped it up in pro tools and just kind of arranged it on their own. But that reminds um, me, I, I talked with uh, Hank Shockley from, uh, uh, you know, oh, wow. done all of that early legend. public enemy. So legend. Yeah. And he was telling me, um, this is going to be a four year era. You you weren't coming up during the pause tape era, were you? No, no. Yeah. No. So I, I was like right, right after that. <laughs> so just for the, for the viewers watching a pause tape was when, you know, this is like as, as much as I'm saying that Khalil's era was primitive, you were like in the <laughs> Cadillac gravy times compared to like yeah. 15 years earlier. Yeah. And so what uh, what Hank used to do is he'd make these pause tapes where you you get a record, you play like, you know, the two bars of the beat that that you want to sample onto a cassette tape. You, you let off the record head and then you pause it and then you cue up those two bars again and then you let it up and then you pause it and you build up your loop by just you know, unpausing, repausing the tape. And, but what he told me was that um, one of them, and I don't remember what track it was, one of those early Public Enemy tracks was a pause tape that... Uh, Chuck Crazy. was just improving live on his radio show and they just did it in that one Crazy. moment. And then it was like, Oh, let's, well, we will just use that. We can't recreate that. Can't get the tape to sound quite that way. And we can't get yeah. Chuck's bars to sound the way they did. Let's just put it out. Right. You let's know, put it out that Crazy. so yeah, so it, it, that stuff happens, but, but you, um, when you, you're talking about, so when you're, when you're doing that stuff with genius and stuff, I mean, you, did you find sort of, those placements early on like what was your kind of how did you go from being kind of you know the kid at morehouse you know trying to read the manual or figure out the asr 10 to actually getting some of these beats in front of people and, and getting people on them yeah so um yeah really it was really you know we started it was really sub-scientific that led to that because we put out our first album and that's when I started getting attention as a producer because it was like a critically acclaimed album. You know, some of our singles were being played on like a lot of the mix, you know, mix shows like hip hop mix shows. Um, and I just started getting a name for myself. And then so my first placement was with Razcast. I did a song with Razcast called, I mean, I did a couple with him for his album Van Gogh, which never really came out, never got released. But one of the songs that we did got placed in, in a Sopranos TV show. And that was like, really like my first, it, it was the season premiere of the second season. And that was kind of like my first placement, um, technically. And from there on, you know, from, from that point on, it was like, you had beat brokers. So you had guys that were just like shopping beats for like random, like a bunch of producers. They would just go around and, and grab beats and then take it and play it for the artist. So I had a bunch of friends that were doing that and and ended up working with like Keith Murray on Def Jam. That was like his comeback record. Mm. I did a, a movie star. I mean, Candy Bar. It's called Candy Bar. Um, and and then like, yeah, my beat started circulating because like I was making like eight to ten beats a day, easily. Mm. And so you know my beats just started floating around. Um, There's this artist named Brooklyn who demoed a bunch of a bunch of my beats um, along with a bunch of other producers. And she ended up getting signed to Dr. Dre. And so Dre loved all the records. He loved the production. So he they called all the producers in. And I remember, you know, I had met Dre when I was 13 through my sister because they were really good friends. Huh. And so, and that was like years before. So when I get reintroduced back to him, you know, I'm, he remembered me. Oh, and wow. So, yeah, so then we just kind of like, you know, he was like, yo, you did these tracks? And I was like, yeah. He's like, oh, that's crazy. Because he's like, I remember you told me you were going to be a producer. I, like, I told him, I was like, I'm going to be a producer just like you. Because I was already a DJ at that point. Um, so he, uh, you know, he you know, he just got a kick out of it. He told the whole studio, everybody in the studio, the whole story. And then, you know, and then he, you know, he kept the tracks. I came in, I tracked them. 
But then he was like, yo, do you have more? And I was just hitting them with so many beats. Oh, wow. To that's the point that, where like, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. That's that idea. You know, I, I, there's that thing where they people always, you know, when it comes to success, people talk about sort of, oh, you got to be at the right place at the right time. And there's this idea out there that's like, no, that's kind of only even a small part of the pie. It's, you got to be ready when the right place and yeah. time happens. And that's what you, you yeah. do. If you didn't have all that stuff to pull out and, you know. Yeah. I would have missed the opportunity. Yeah. I, I would have totally missed the opportunity. And, and like at that time it was, you know, you, you were competing against, you were competing against Jay Dilla and, and, and people like that because you get a beat CD from him and he'd have 60 beats on there and they were all incredible. So, right. you know, people like him, you know, like you had to, you really had to step your game up, and, you know, when you walked in the studio, because at the time you're competing with Just Blaze kanye like everybody was just getting started you know at, at that point yeah so, how i mean you, they were already kind of they were big at that point but you know you're still competing against them of course and how do you you know there there must be a certain amount of i guess belief in self or something but how do you not almost get discouraged when you're hearing some of that stuff i mean some of that stuff is still you know you know what was groundbreaking and kind of shifted the entire direction of where production was going. And so you're hearing that in the moment and you must be thinking, "Uh oh, these these guys are <laughs> these guys are good, <laughs> you know." I love it. I loved it. I love music. Like I loved hearing I love hearing stuff that inspires me. Like even when I heard, you know, Mecham the Soul Brother for the first time, you know, that was at that point I was like, I want to do this. I want to I, I want to continue mm. pursuing producing because i was like you can actually create something like this i could i just couldn't believe that that was even possible you right. know you're taking samples from other records and you're putting it together to make it sound like this right and i just and to me it's just it's still fascinating to this day i just i still i i can hear other producers and people that i know and i listen to their stuff I'm like dude how do you like you know and they they think the same way about me like when i when i create they're like dude what do you think like what is going through your brain so it's the creativity and just the love of music that drives you. It's not really like there's competition, but it's almost like you don't you don't run away from it. You're just inspired by it. I use it for inspiration. Right. You know what I mean? Um, but the the competition is always there. You know what I mean? That that's that's you still you still feel that to this day? Yeah, it's always it's always competitive. Huh. It's always competitive. You know what I mean? People, you know, it's it's everybody is everybody's trying to get the edge now, you know, at, at this point. But it's not like we're battling. It's just like, okay, man, you're really, you know, like certain producers, you're like, okay, you're taking it there. They're, you know, they're taking the production to to the next level. So you're like, okay, I gotta, I gotta step it up, or I'm gonna get left behind. Right. I just, you know, and I'm one of the producers. I don't want to get left behind. I wanna, I wanna adapt to what's going on. I wanna learn from younger producers. That that's really where I'm at now. Right. So, right. Yeah. I it's know. Just inspiration. You know, speaking of that, I know that, um, so we did this, uh, a beat map product that we, uh, we put out a rack extension called beat map for that. I worked with Mike and keys and those guys yeah. had so much positive stuff to say about your sort of mentorship, I guess, be, you know, not to make it sound, yeah. you know, kind of, yeah. but, but kind of, you know, like yeah, gu of, yeah. guidance and, and, and inspiration that you were giving them. And they, you know, it was just such a an important part of for them but it's it's interesting what you just said you know you you it helps you kind of being around you know people that are kind of young and coming yeah. in as well that keeps you fresh so there's a little bit of that bi-directional kind of yeah. benefit to it you know yeah i mean i learned that from dre because dre brought mm. us around and he was learning from us you know just as much as we don't we didn't know that because we're like oh my god it's dre but he's watching us like okay I see where you guys are taking it. I, you know, I can add this to my production as well. You know right. I mean? But he, but you know, the thing is like Dre's a different kind of producer because he can orchestrate, he has a vision. So if he brings you in, you're just a, you're like an instrument, you know, that's a part of his, his entire vision. Yeah. But like, but he's learning from us just like we're learning from him, you know? And so I feel like he never, he never misses the opportunity to learn. And, the, and like, with Mike and Keys, when I first met them, I, I couldn't, when they were playing, they were like, yeah, we use Reason. They played their beats. I was like, you've got to be kidding me. I was like, how are you doing this? Like, because it was like the next level. Like, they took Reason, because we were both Reason users, and they were like, I was like, it's so polished, but it was still so raw in hip-hop mm. that I was just like, 
these dudes are incredible and we built a relationship even a business relationship and we and we still create we talk all the time like those are those are my guys man. yeah i, I love those guys. they have their and what they did with nipsey and like their vi they had a vision of what they wanted to do and i feel like now people are hearing what they you know what they what they were always capable of but now it's like they've taken they made a classic they made a a west coast classic right you know, and we were all a part of it but they but they stuck with nipsey through the whole thing you know and we and we just helped them we tried to help put put the album together yeah wow so, salute to mike and keys man they they, oh, they sure. teach me a lot they, they taught me a lot i like what you said yeah. about that they um they managed to have it sound polished but raw for hip-hop and yeah like that's gotta be you know thinking about where you came from kind of coming in through the modules and the asr 10 like that sounded raw because it was raw right yeah and yeah, yeah. you know if you could make it sound polished too that was like you must be an expert but but that's more the challenge these days right because it's so easy to sound polished that's not the trick anymore it's more how yeah. to keep some of that kind of the the spontaneity that i guess sounds raw isn't that is that would you say that's true that it's sort of a the spontaneity yeah, I mean, spontaneous I, cre creation moment or yeah i mean that that's what my my production my production is based off of because you know i i build you know i have musicians that i work with and like when i got away from sampling you know i just started working with tons of musicians and we and that's how I really started making samples. I mean, back in like 2006, like no one was really doing that. Um, so I would just get in. We, I would literally buy, I would look at the back of prog rock records and be like, okay, um, you know, electric harpsichord, uh, string, arp string ensemble, you know, and I would just, okay, I, I need to, I started looking them up and I just started buying old synths. And at the time it wasn't like a big thing because, you know, people weren't really onto it. Like now analog is a huge, it's right. just huge business like every you know everybody wants to have an analog synth in their studio but back then that's you know i was trying to recreate those sounds i was hearing on those records so when i started hooking up with musicians i would just reference the record and i would have the keyboard there and i would just there i would stay there and tweak sounds until i got the exact sound i heard on this record if i heard a yes record or gentle giant or any of those kind of right. it's like I, you're, you're speaking my high school that. uh my high school record, yeah. record. <laughs> <laughs> Genesis and all that kind of, I'm, I, like I study that like literally every day. That's all I listen to is prog rock. So, right now, I, I'm curious. Are there, first of all, I want I I think this is such a I think an interesting way that you came about to this. So I'm gonna I'm gonna walk people there a little a, a little bit. You started when you were talking about you, with your your AS10 ASR10 era. You were sneaking your yeah. dad's records out of the house, you know, to yeah. trying to get them yeah, out yeah. without him knowing. Um, at that at that point, I, I had started buying records, but the first like in tenth grade, I was like all my dad's records. Right, dad, but so, dad, but that you you what you're talking about here is that that you transitioned from sampling records to to something else entirely, and, and I'm I'm curious as to the, the motivation for that. Why weren't you just continuing to like crate dig and sample records kind of as your well I was, still, I was still crate digging but i was using it for inspiration because when i when i did when i worked on gene and it which sold like three million copies it's a huge record you know because 50 was big at the time and it's kind of like a classic because if you look at all the producers on there they're kind of like culture changers you know from knots to jake one to you know mr porter to, i mean like you name it they're yeah. on that album literally um so it was like kind of like a landmark album. The production is, you know, it's just it's just timeless. But like, I remember my manager at the time, you know, when he was like, you know, yeah, it sold three million copies, but you you're not making anything on royalties. Like, you're not going to get any royalties. I was like, why not? Because you sampled. I, I I literally looped a prog rock record and like you know just put synths on top of it. And I was I I didn't really understand publishing at that time, right? Or how sampling even worked. You know that you had to clear the master and you had to pay for the master and then you have the publishing and they could determine how much publishing they wanted to take depending on how much you use so so it was like it was just like the hardest news to take at the time because yeah. i'm thinking like oh i'm gonna make some money and when he told me how much money i lost potentially you know from a three million selling album i was like sick for like three weeks oh like my I god like, i hope you at least got like a nice christmas gift from gentle giant that year you know <laughs> <laughs> it was like 
it was actually the group was clot too it was a group called clot too i think they're canadian they're canadian I, I can't remember but gotcha but they they got paid they got they got a nice check from from uh from beg for mercy for sure and so it was you know yeah go ahead, but so sorry. what you're saying though is that you sort of, that you had that moment and yeah. it, it caused you to go like oh well, I can't. This is not a business model I can keep up. So you, yeah. you're saying you would get the records, you'd flip over the LP jacket on the record, and it would say it would have the credits like so and so played harpsichord, so and so played, you know, yeah. Moog synth or whatever. They might sometimes list that much yeah. detail, and you would just treat yeah. that as like, oh, so I can make my own samples if I just take this same mix of instruments, yeah, and do it, yeah, and yeah. and that, that was that was the idea, and 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 it. It took a while because at first I didn't have musicians. It was just me. I had to teach myself how to play, and I and I did. Like I, I started every day just playing. Like and my beats were horrible at the beginning, but I remember I first when I got to Still Will Kill when I did that song for Fifty. I mean I played everything on that record, and that was like I was like I can do this. Like I can actually not sample and it can still sound just as dope as I did before. You know when I was sampling. And, and so would like, you? I had that record, yeah. Would you sort of make kind of maybe not a full song, but would you kind of make like a a sixteen bar idea that is meant to sound like an like a record, and then you would two track that out and then chop it as a sample? Is that kind of the way you're? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like we we would. I just hit record. I mean, some sometimes the sessions would be like a half hour, forty five minutes, right? I'm just playing music, and I'm just what I what I do. What I would do is like just. I would set up all the keyboards and sounds and like all the effects, everything is already set up. So when we, all you all I had to do was just hit record. I play the reference, like one of my old records, like let's try to go for this vibe. And we would jam. And most of the time we, we would, it would go somewhere else. We would start in a certain place and then you catch those moments. Cause really when you listen to records, you're listening for a moment. That's all we're looking for. Right. So, you know what I mean? So, that's all I'm trying to do when I'm doing jam sessions is create moments that I can that I can flip. And so that became my process. You know, after after the whole genius thing, that was like, okay, this is I, I know I can do this now. And I can make samples on par with the records I used to sample. You know what I mean? Um, well, you I know, had it's, string players, I had everything. It's interesting. Yeah, you're, what what's being said here in the comments, I'm seeing comments that uh, people are saying not only could you make records like you could, but there's a, an opinion out there that actually this is when your beats really took off. Is that yeah. that they really went next level in, in yeah. something that probably to, at some point when you were sitting there trying to figure out how to how to play like you wanted to, it probably felt like quite a hurdle, and that you actually were taking a step back. But yeah. by taking it's it's sort of like pulling the rubber band back. By pulling it back, you actually you know yeah. shot forward quite a bit more. Yeah, and, and I, I mean, but it's, it's just the curiosity, you know, you just, you know, it's like, can I do this? Like, let me just see if I can push through and figure out, like, how to how to crack the code, you know, mm. and then you you work on it long enough, you're going to crack it. It's going to happen. Right. I'm sorry. You know, no, but I, I, I'm thinking about this as a kind of as a, a guidance for people out there that, that maybe are making beats, you know, these days, um, we have things out there that you wouldn't need to do what you you needed to do it. You were looking at it. You were facing either that, that clot two was going to, you know, be making all your money or you were. And so you had to yeah. adapt and it was sort of just that survival of the fittest mentality. Nowadays, you know, we have things like splice where like you can go on there and you could kind of create dig and find samples and kind of make beats and you, you do whatever. I'm sure people do it. But, yeah. but I think the lesson there for people is that, Sometimes by taking, and I don't want to say that when you were taking samples off records, it was the easy route, but probably easier in some sense than having to figure out how to make your own records. Um, so sometimes that that path of least resistance, which these days might be splice, actually is denying yourself as an artist for the people who are watching. So maybe denying themselves the chance to actually grow into and rise to the occasion. So I think it's probably a, a, a something, yeah. if people haven't done it, it's probably worth trying, like, do, anyone can do this. They could try and you know find a record they like and try and create your own thing in that vibe, you know? Oh, yeah. I mean, it's it, it's fun, though. That the, the thing, it's not work. Like, that. that's, I think it, it's work just to get it set up to where you're like, okay, I got found the musicians. I found the people I want to collaborate with. But once you hit record mm -hmm. and you bring in the, like, the musicians that you feel are dope, what's crazy is, like, 
a whole new world unfolds that you didn't even know was even possible. And that's the thing. It's like you realize what the possibilities are with music that you didn't know because we sit there, you know, by ourselves, just, you know, making beats every day. And that's just, we're kind of confined to what that is. But when you put musicians in a room and they bring their perspectives in and like, you know, one person may be having a bad day, but that may be the day that they play something magical and you, you leave it to human experience and, and that, that human element is what makes music incredible. That's what makes it timeless. Yeah. Most of my, most of my music, if you, if you go back and, look at my track record you know a a lot of a lot of songs are deal with like personal struggle or you know whether it's like fear by drake or talking to myself eminem it's about you know people like to air out their feelings on some of my productions because that's how i approach it when i go when when i go into to work it's really about like what do i have to express Mm. you know i think now people are caught up with the placement thing which is cool if that's what you want to do, but it's really about expression. What music is about expression. It's not about how much money I can make. What I didn't even know I can make money doing this. I had no idea. Hmm. When I worked up with Razcast, that was the first check I ever got. That was the most money I ever made. And I was like, what? Like, I didn't even, you get paid for this? <laughs> and I knew there were people that, I knew Dr. Dre had a lot of money and all that, but I didn't really understand like the mechanics of how like I can make something and somebody's going to buy it and there's an advance and all that, you know, I didn't get that. Yeah. I just thought like, I'm, I just want to be like my heroes and I want to hmm. be able to express myself the way they're expressing themselves. Right. Like, you, you said yeah. something um, that I thought was kind of a good a way to describe it. You said when you were looking for samples and looking on records, you were looking for a moment. Yeah. I wonder yeah. if you could tell me what you, what, what is a moment to you? A moment is, is just, I mean, you just know it when you hear it, you know, when something hits you, you know, we all listen to samples. Like, even if you listen to a four bar loop, that's a moment, you know, people are just shortening <laughs> the, the, you know, the, you know, the opportunity for you to find something else, but people are creating, you know, four bar moments. That's what, that's what people like, you know, when I, when I listen to a Q beats or a, you know what I mean? Or a Frank, did, like, I'm sure all those guys were, you know, they, they bought records and that's what they, they grew up doing was like finding loops and, right. and, study, and studying. And it gets to a point where you can identify, you know, you just become good at it. Once you listen to a lot of records, you, you hear stuff and you internalize all of those melodies and all that harmonic information. You're internalizing that. Mm. So it gives you, it gives you an advantage when you create, because you, you, that melody, you can play that on the keyboard because you remember it from something. You know what I mean? Right. So it's like, so I, I always use like, you know, studying records is like a huge part of what I do. I still do. I still go on YouTube or I buy records, you know, not as much as I, I would like. Like I'm trying to get even heavier into it, you know, like like I used to, to be. But but it's really it's a big it's a big part of like finding new sounds, finding new textures and finding moments like, you know, when, when we listen to a five minute or a three minute song on the radio. That's just a moment. Somebody caught an amazing moment and a performance and the production, everything comes together right. to create a moment. Right. That's what we're listening to. That is, that's what music is. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. There's a, a book about photography. Um, it's called on photography by Susan Sontag. And she talks about why do we photograph things? Like what is our, what is it in our nature that makes us want to capture photographs and and that sort of is the heart of her thing is that we are we are capturing in a you know in a 60th of a second or 200th of a second we're capturing this one sliver of a moment and then we're expanding it out into this thing that you can look at forever and you can see new things and experience things and different people experience it differently and and i think there's a lot of parallels there to music in that um, it's, it's almost the opposite. It's like, you can't listen to music at a 200th of a second clip. You actually, you can only listen to it when it's stretched out, but you're still, yeah. you're, you know, it's that it's experiencing that moment. The way I experience it is different than the way you do, but then there's that I can convey through production. I can convey the way I'm experiencing it to you. You know, there's that listener yeah. producer connection as well. I wanted yeah. to, to ask a, uh, a little bit. So this time we're talking about when you started producing your own, you know, samples and records and stuff. Um, yeah, that is also the time that you were, you were getting deep. You, you've sort of, you've had a, um, a two era reason, uh, 
oh, yeah. sort of yeah. experience, right? So that was era yeah. one of your reason experience. Is that true? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was that was I was still on reason and making samples for sure because I was using you know I made like all my own common air patches and my own library of sound. So I had built you know just from studying those old records. So I was incorporating that in our jams. But I think I kind of hit a ceiling because that that's when you had rewire and I had to rewire with Pro Tools. And it just it was just kind of like really difficult um, to capture moments. Right. So that's when that's when I moved to Ableton because Ableton allowed me to do my jam sessions and catch everything when I need to. Like I don't have to wait. I don't have to like um, try to sync two different DAWs together. It was just like it's all in one. Yeah. You know, well I can pull up VSTs. I can pull up drums, um, and even like you know, records like Anderson Pack, like Heart Don't Stand a Chance, like that was done on V drums. That mm. wasn't even done on a regular drum set. But like if I, if I didn't use Ableton, there's no way I would have been able to make that record because that was literally a 20 minute jam session. And he, I put the, I literally set the studio up, you know, just like he performs. I put the mic on the V, you know, like right, you know, so he can sing yeah. and play the drums at the same time. And it was like making him comfortable to where it's like, he had, he was like, we're gonna use the V drums. I was like, yeah, let's let's you know. I, I, trust me, I've been doing it for like a couple of years at that point, and we literally did it in twenty minutes. And he sang he sang everything like right down like, it, it in terms of like he didn't have the lyric yet, but he definitely like had the concept, and it just came together. Twenty minutes, we were pretty much done. We had the first verse. He came back a month later, did the second verse. Huh. But it's like. I couldn't do that in, in reason at the time because I, I don't even think, yeah, I mean there was audio in there, but you just you just couldn't capture stuff the way you could in Ableton. Right, so, and so that's why I kind of moved over. You moved over, and then now when you and I spoke, um, well, maybe it was six months ago or something, when we reconnected, um, yeah. that was now you were um, sort of it was the the second honeymoon in a way. You were um, yeah. you were talking to me. You had just gotten. I was hyped. You were hyped, yeah. <laughs> I was hyped, man. Yeah. I, was hyped. I was hyped about reading Eleven because it, 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 uh, because being able to use all the you know instruments and effects and everything in Ableton now, like literally changed. I mean, it took Ableton to the next level for me. So like, but I go back and forth because sometimes I work just in Reason. Like I use Reason to make hip hop. You know, because I have a certain swing and a certain punch that I can't get in Ableton. Mm. But, but with Ableton, I do all my writing and all my jam sessions. And then I do some beats in there, but like it's, and I make a lot of samples in Ableton because it's just a lot easier to, to capture stuff. Gotcha. But, but you know, I, I use both. I mean, I use both. Like I split the time between both, literally. Right. I go back and forth. Right. Well, this is the thing oh, we're, what we're, yeah, what we're hearing from, from guys um, that are, that are in 11 and using it in the plugin, there are people out there that have just been sort of like, you know, for, for one reason or another, they have, they have moved. I mean, this is true. I think of probably everyone in the comments and all of us that you move through different DAWs in, in your musical life, you try things. I mean, I started in a program that isn't made anymore called deck, which was sort of a pro tools uh, thing, then moved into pro tools, then logic, then Ableton and reason. And, you know, I mean, there's, we all move through these things, but the, the thing we're hearing from people now is that with Reason 11, they are sort of bringing Reason with them when they go these other places and, and they're getting yeah. some of these beloved devices. Like, uh, I, I think it was, is it, isn't you that you're, you're quite a Scream 4 fan? Scream 4 is, is like, the, I feel like one of the greatest plugins ever created for sound, for coloring sound and texture, like, especially for drums, hi hats, and snares. I mean, you know, because I, I, I really, became known for my drums like you know everybody's like man what are you doing with your drums that was like the secret weapon always that was always my secret weapon because you can color it and there's certain that that eq on there it's like it's so precise so how i hear it in my head right i can literally do it with the screen four isn't that wild that the the eq on there so it's just a three band eq and yet it's, it's like incredible. it's the right three bands <laughs> it's perfect it's so perfect yeah i mean for hi-hats for hi-hats and i wouldn't use it for kicks but for hi hats and snares, I mean that's my go-to. I use that for everything. Right, it's, right. It's magic. I mean, it, it, as soon as you add it, it's like even even the instruments too. But 
uh, snares and uh, hi hats. It's incredible. Gotcha. Well, I wonder. Maybe we should kind of check out. You've got uh, Ableton and, and the Reason Rack plugin uh, up there, right? Yeah. I wonder if we could yeah, maybe take yeah. a kind of peek at kind of what what you do and with it and and with that combo these days. And then um, I I want to make sure that we have some time to field some questions from people because um, we've got questions that came in and I'm sure they'd love to to know some stuff. Um, but let's uh, let me sort of swing over here and bring your screen up a little bit. So is this what we're looking at? Is this kind of a, a starter template that you tend to uh, work yeah. in? Yeah. So I have, you know, I have like reason racks already in my in my template this is like a session i kind of started last night but but I, I i love radical piano i feel like radical piano is one of the best piano you know like plugins mm -hmm. um it just has the vibe is just incredible um and uh let me just uh, but um yes yeah, so i'll use like i use this radical piano And um, huh. these are all my reasons. Now. Sorry, hold on. This is... Oh, because I still have this on. So, what I've been doing lately, especially during the quarantine, is I I I found this. Um, well, a friend of mine put me on. My, my friend Siege monstrosity put me onto this thing called Chordimus, which is this Max for Live device right here, which is like a chord generator. And <laughs> I post I had posted it on my stories like maybe like a couple weeks ago. And people were like, what is that? So it's like it's like Cthulhu and some of these other chord generators, but what's cool about this is that it it's it sounds like somebody's actually playing. So you know I feel like it has a human element to it where like Cthulhu is just kind of like, you just get the chords. Right. You know, so I can, I can, uh... Oh, you know, Cleo, could you, could you pop up, yeah. um, the volume on Radical Piano a little bit? Yeah. Yeah. Sorry about that. That's all right. Cool. So it's doing, it's kind of doing that. Um, I believe that the Italian term is glissando, that kind of yeah moving around the keys, huh? So, sorry, I'm gonna cut this real So, you know, with that, it's like, there's so many possible, now I can like, I can start adding, like, you know, cause I'm real big on layering and trying different sounds, like different combinations of sounds. So, like, I like this blanket piano. And then with the subtractor, I'll like reset the device and start it. Um, start from like the initial patch. Okay, there we go. And right, so <laughs> so I'll just make a sound real quick. Sure. Um, so yeah, I'll take you know. Mess with the filter a little bit. Right, so <laughs> now I'm gonna just mess with the portamento, um, put it in legato right now, and then, um, and then I'll mess with the frequency through the LFO. <laughs> there are some people in the comments almost uh, shocked almost shocked at the combination of radical piano and subtractor but it's cool it's like you know it's like pepperoni and jelly sandwich like it shouldn't work yeah. but it works <laughs> yeah like that's what i always try different combinations of sounds because people are always looking for different textures because i use this to like make samples a lot now yeah and it just like with reason you can it's so easy to stack sounds and to eq and like add so like i'll add like effects to it like i'll add like an echo and then like turn the feedback up turn the time of the delay down sorry i don't know if it's too loud or not but, um, 
It is definitely it is definitely like vibe on overdrive, you know? <laughs> I mean that's the thing, is like just making sounds that take you to another place. Cause sometimes sound because even when you have keyboard players, they don't want to just play like regular stock sounds all the time. They well, sometimes they'll hear something and be like, yo, I wanna play that. Right. You know, and that's I always, I always want that that reaction from them. It's like, yo, I I need to jump on that right now. Like that sound is crazy. Um, so I always try to like, you know, I'll, I'll tweak the sounds before anybody even touches the instrument. I try to like, I'll try to set the vibe with the effects. So you'll set up, you'll set up something like this as maybe a sound, and then you will take that to a keyboard player and then yeah. kind of get their gears turning. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Right. And even with guitars, like I'll use anything from guitar rig to like pedals like i buy a lot of pedals now so i have like it's not even a pedal board but i have like a string of pedals that i use and like we'll literally sit there and and i'll i'll tweak the sounds or just have them play and we'll get all these combination of sounds together and then once i'm like okay these fit really well then we'll jam and we'll do like an hour of that you huh. know just 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 for that texture then we'll stop i'll like okay guys take a break They'll be out eating, doing whatever. I'll go and tweak the sound again, change the sounds. They come back in. It's a whole new palette of sounds. And wow. so, and then we'll do another hour or 45 minutes or whatever that is. So, you know, there's, I just there's so that, many, like, there's so many little micro layers of, of knowledge that are being dropped right there. Like I, I I'm going to mention them yeah. just for people to catch it. What you, <laughs> it's the most unimportant detail you just said but it is, you said, while they go out to eat and it's like, that's the psychology of production where it's like, right. you know, like, you know what guys go hang out, chill, get a bite to eat. I'm going to kind of tweak some stuff. Cause if you had, you know, as a producer, if you're, you're in the studio you're thinking, I got these guys here, I got to make the most of them, but I want to tweak these sounds. If you had just made them all sit around for an hour or while you're tweaking yeah. stuff, like you're, you kill the vibe, but now they come back, they're refreshed, they're, you know, they're well yeah. fed, they're whatever. And they can kind of you know so i i even love those little things of like that that comes from experience and learning you know at, when you're a producer you're not just the tech guy you are you're the psychologist as well you know yeah because for me it's like i don't really i rarely use engineers in my for my jam sessions i just i like to man the sessions because i hate missing the moments like if something's happening and it's not recording that is the most that pisses me off because <laughs> Because you're not going to get it back, you know. You're yeah. not going to you're not going to get that moment back, and you and so, that's funny. When I went to work at uh, Rick Rubin's studio at Shangri La one time, mm -hmm. and I noticed he had like, you know, he had his whole setup, and they had like a rig, but in the back they had another rig that was just on. You could see it; it was running the whole time. Oh. I, was like, I was like, why do you guys have that rig? He was like, because Rick. Rick Rubin does not like to miss anything in his studio so that it's constantly on no matter what. So if somebody picks up an instrument, it's being recorded right. at all times, 24 seven. Right. I was like, that is genius because nothing makes a producer more angry than missing the moment. Totally. Um, it's, 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 that is like key to production. Wow. If you miss it, you're never getting it back. Yeah. Yeah. You rarely get it back. You rarely get it back. So you I know, did, you know, I've done a lot of uh, documentary uh, filming and production and stuff. And, and when I'm out in the field filming, I have this um, question that is just, I'm absolutely, I'm like triggered by it now. It's just total PTSD kind of question. And yeah. it's the, the question is, did you get that? Because if you're out <laughs> filming something, the you know like I I would follow a band a lot and something crazy would happen and suddenly someone would go like oh my god tell me you got that did you get that and like <laughs> it's the worst question because first of all if I didn't I hate myself now and <laughs> if I did you've kind of ruined it by throwing that out like if I'm you know let's say some some crazy fan does something crazy and then instantly on the sound and or someone turns the camera and goes did you get that and it's like i'm holding the camera i got it don't just like chill like don't ask me that question right. <laughs> but i learned that early on is that like nothing i mean just for my own sake as you know i'm in the field sort of working as both cameraman and director but it's like 
I don't want to miss anything. I want to I want to be all places at all times, filming all things, capturing all moments. That doesn't yeah. quite work out, but nothing sucks more than not getting a moment and being like, you can't no, get it back. That yeah. one moment could be like the difference maker. Yeah, for yeah. The rest of your life, literally, that one missing that one thing. So, you know, I learned that from Dre too, because Dre is like, let's get it, let's get it right now, and let's not, you know, and and the the, the beauty of what he does is he knows how to put people in the moment. I've I've watched him coach, I watched him coach uh, artists that have 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 like minimal studio experience, but he got them to the point where they performed it at such a high level. They didn't even know they could do it. You know what mm. I mean? So it's really just like those, you know, we keep coming back to moments. That is, is the most important thing in music. That is what music is. It's yeah. Just, it's a, it's, 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 it's almost, it's a time machine. I forgot who said that, but music is like a time machine. Cause you remember when you, where you first heard a certain song right? Or, or what happening during a certain, you know, and it changes, like even music changes the molecules in a room. You could be in a room and it, the vibe could be off. And as soon as you put on something that's, you know, like Michael Jackson or something, it's like the whole, everything changes. The whole mood changes. So it's like. This is my, just my one of my favorite quotes. I've mentioned this on the stream. So people have seen this might have heard me already say this, but it's one of my favorite quotes about music of all time. In um, the, the biography, Tom Petty had a, a biography written about him and they were describing his band, Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers. And they, what they said was, what the author said was, um, the Heartbreakers were the type of musicians who were careful when there was a song in the room because there was a song in the room. And I was like, oh my God, like that That's is such true. a perfect articulation of things that you've certainly felt. Times yeah. when all of a sudden, it's like, there's times where you're playing music and then there's times where you're playing music and suddenly it's like, hang on, there's a song in the room. Like this is happening, you know? And- right. Right. That's so incredible. that is, yeah, that is, that is totally the same thing you're talking about. It's like, it's the moment and it can transport you back. It can change the molecules in the room. It's all that. That's yeah. That is uh when there's a song in the room. So what yeah. a, what a, a, an ever elusive thing to try and chase though. I mean, your, your chase, you know, your whole career has been about trying to like, you know, it's like a treasure hunt. You're like searching for yeah. that moment at all times. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's that, but that's, that's exciting. You know, it's exciting because you know that it's right there. It's like right around the corner. You just have to like put people in a certain mind frame to want to go there. And so, certain people are just already there. You don't have to do anything. Yeah. And then sometimes you have to like put people in that space. And that's what a producer does. You know, we, we try to get people to, to buy into the moment and to not be distracted by whatever else is going on. Like, let's be here. Let's be present right now. Um, cause that is, I mean, even, even for me as a creator, like sometimes my, my mind is, you know, you could have a million things going on and you're not really paying attention to what's happening and something could be happening. Your brain, you're not receiving the signals. Mm. You're not, you know, so it's like, you're just, you're blocking everything out and it could be happening right in front of you. You're just not hearing it. So it's like putting yourself in the, in a position where you can hear everything, you know, you're open, you're you're not shutting off the possibilities. And that's really like, my goal is with myself is like, I got to make sure I'm not shutting off the possibility. Yeah. Right. Right. When, whenever I go into a session and that could just be my attitude, I could just have a bad day and be like, <laughs> I don't want to be here. I don't want to work on this, but that day I could have, if I had the right attitude, I could have, I could have made something incredible. So I, I try to, I try to work on that. You know, that, that's like, that's my challenge every day. There's a, an interesting question that popped up on the chat here that is kind of relevant to that. Uh, they, I think, I think it's relevant based on what I'm inferring from the question. They ask, "What is your smartphone policy in the studio?" <laughs> I tried to, I, I tried to uh, make everybody. I, I wanted to do like a cell phone check at my, you know, at my studio. It's just too hard because, especially with new artists, that because. I feel like artists now are like they're music artists, but they're also celebrities because because of social media, mm. there's so much going on. They, they have to stay connected. That's just a part of their business. So it's, you know, it's hard to get them to detach from their phones. But sometimes it's a big it's a big problem for me. It's been a big problem um, because we're not I'm not getting songs done. We're not leaving with a song sometimes. And like I'm not like a tyrant in the studio. Yeah. Like your phone down i'm not going to tell you that either you want to do it or you don't you know either you want to 
make great music or you want to be which you have to pick which one you want to be yeah and there are a lot of artists that they're good they're great artists but you know their brands too on top of it so they have to the good ones know how to separate the two they know how to put it down and be like okay i need to be in this moment on a player level though if if uh if i were to come into your studio as a keyboardist to, to plan one of these sessions I would imagine with that one, you may not tell me to put my phone away, but I might not come back if I'm on it too much too, right? Is that? Yeah, no. I mean, if, if we're working, like if we're taking a break, yeah, get on your phone, talk, do whatever. I'm, I'm cool with that. When we're playing, we're not looking at our phones. Like, right. I'm not, we're, you know, that, that just can't happen. That just can't happen. So for jam sessions, you know, everybody has their phone, but everybody knows that we have to stay locked in. Like you have to pay attention to what's going on. Cause I can tell, you know, if you're not there, you know, I can, I can tell just by what you're playing Yeah, and you're not feeling anything. See, that's the thing is like, if you're on your phone, you can't really tap into what, how you're feeling in my opinion. Yeah. So when you're playing your, your emotions, everything's distracted. You're not able to lock in on the moment and play something that actually makes me feel something or make someone else feel something. Right. And that, that's the whole point is like, I want musicians that want to feel, I don't care if you're technically amazing. It's really just about how, like, do you make me feel something when I hear it? When I yeah. Hear play? <laughs> Someone, and are you, making, in, and are you making space for the other musicians? Cause some, some, some musicians are harmonic, like hogs. Like they want to oh. take up all the harmonic space huh. and not leave enough for, for the guitar player or the bass player. That's a, that's a skill you know, is to like know how to play around other people. And yeah. Listen what's happening. Yeah. 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 There's a, um, a comment, uh, black house seven, uh, in the, uh, comments section says a session with Khalil. Fuck that phone. <laughs> 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 I think that's probably, it's not that bad, but, <laughs> <laughs> no, but I mean, like I, I could imagine too, like, like, yeah, it makes some priorities. If you're in the studio with Khalil, like, I don't think you really need to like slide into those DMS right now. Like you can, <laughs> <laughs> handle that later <laughs> oh my gosh uh well should we do you, do you want to field some other questions here because there are some coming in yeah, here sure. uh, from people yeah. um there was one uh a little earlier someone had asked uh, and i'm i'm not quite sure if they i what i what i sense well here's the question and we'll we'll interpret yeah. it i think they're asking about themselves they say how do you get your love back for making music and it sounds like maybe they're having a crisis of faith um how do you get your love back i mean have you ever had moments where where it feels more like a grind and and you kind of need to... absolutely all the time um i think it's important how do i answer this like i went through i mean it just depends on what's going on in your life because like i went through you know severely depressed moments in my life music got me through that but then there were certain parts where you know like my dad was really sick i couldn't I just couldn't create. I, I had nothing to say. Mm. And like, I feel like it's right. It's like finding your purpose. Like I, I lost my purpose during a certain time. I could even go back to like, when I was on reason, like when I was on reason five and I listened to everything that I did on reason five it is you, it's unlistenable. You can't even listen to it wow. because my thoughts and everything was so distorted and I didn't want to do it. You can tell that I wasn't, present i didn't want to make music i was just doing it because i felt like i had to and and that's okay like i think it's it's willing it's, it's being able to say you know what i'm not feeling music right now like i don't want to make and you can you can step away from it or you can push through and and and, and try to find it i think like it's also about the people you're around like sometimes it's like finding a person that can spark you into being creative like that's why i, I go and seek it out um, I have musicians that I work with, but then I'll I'll go see Mike and Keys or I'll talk to, you know, I'll go see uh, DJ Dahi or I'll go see, you know, cats yeah. that just inspire me, dudes that are like killing it right now, you know, cardiac. Like I'll, I'll work with people just to get myself out of a rut. Sometimes you just need to go and collaborate. Don't sit in the studio by yourself thinking it's just going to come because sometimes you can, you can, it's infectious to see somebody who, who is being creative who is hungry and you're like, man, okay, I get it now. You know? Yeah. You know, I, I use that as inspiration. Some people may be discouraged, but I'm like, I could, I could, I've worked with, you know, like cardiac several times in my studio or even Dahi for that matter. 
and I'll watch them work, and I'm like, man, it's like they just, you know, they're just there, and they just work. You know what I mean? Uh, Mike and Key, same thing. I, I, I this is going to be the the weirdest comparison, but I promise yeah. you, I'm going somewhere with this. I was hanging out at a friend's house, and they were talking. They had just gotten a box of beans delivered to their house. It was like yeah. some farm in Mexico that that <laughs> makes beans, and they ship these right. boxes, and they take out the box and. They start talking about it, and there's these beans and these beans, and they are so excited by their beans that I couldn't help just get ex- – I, I, suddenly, I was all into beans. I left their house with a book they lent me on how to cook beans, and I was – I went to the store. I got my own dried beans. Like, I was fully on board. And and so there is something to, like, being – that even if you're kind of in a bit of a, a funk or a malaise or, or not feeling inspired, the, you can feed off someone else's energy and excitement. and. Oh. And really, totally. and it, it, it internalizes in you. you. You like I was genuinely excited about beans in that moment. Less so now, but you, yeah. you know, in, the, in those moments, you're, t- you know, when you're around those people, you can get genuinely excited about. If you weren't feeling it before, you can get genuinely excited about music, and I, yeah. I think that, um, you know, a lot of people that make music, and particularly, uh, you know, when I have some contact with the reason community, like I do on this stream. Right. It can't be understated how much it can be a liability that we all tend to make music at home alone. And yeah. and I would feel, and it sounds like so many of your stories involve moments where you have engineered, not in the tech sense, but like you have manufactured for yourself a collaborative environment. You've brought in people yeah. because that's critical. It's critical. I mean, I learned, you know, Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis, uh, I, I heard a speech like it was really Jimmy Jam who's you know he was like that that was at that time he was saying that's the problem with production even at that point where it was like just one person sitting in a room you know just working on their computer you know you can only get so far in my opinion like you know I think you need to have other people because there's pe- there 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 are musicians and people out there that do things better than what you do. So if you're a producer, like like I learned this from Dre. Dre Dre will bring in a keyboard. Dre can play keys. He's incredible, mm. but he brings in other keyboard players because of their perspective and how they play and how they make him feel. You know, right. um, a guitarist or or whatever. It's it. People bring their perspective, and that that collaborative that collaborative environment actually makes your music better. It adds layers to what you do. I think you know now we're like so on the grid and we're like this is a four bar loop and this is what everybody it's like robotic now everybody wants to follow this template right where you know and and there's nothing wrong with it it's 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 great that's what's going on right now but i feel like that's there's a whole other side of it that's missing that is just as magical and that's just as dope um that creates amazing results you know what i mean yeah um and even with songwriters you know having the right uh, uh song like there, there's a songwriter named uh, nikki greer that i work with and we make samples together and she's incredible she's incredible she works with kanye now um and we still work together but we make like so like gospel samples together and it's just like when she got in into the fold of what we were doing it went like through the roof mm. you know like it, it was like art it was like their playing got better the sounds got better, like everything got better. And I think like when you keep adding to your, you know, to your uh, creative process, these people or whatever, whatever it is that helps your music go to another level, you should do that. It's not about, I can do this by myself. Cause nobody, like Dre is the greatest producer of all, like period, hip hop of all time. Like he's not, he doesn't even believe in that. Like he's actually more collaborative than I've ever seen him. Right. You know what I mean, right. Always producers coming through, and he's like, "Yo, plug up, let's go." That's his whole. That's his because he loves that. He wants to see what the possibilities are and what you're going to bring to the table. So, for most producers, like the collaborative thing will literally change your life. It'll. It took when I was making beats by myself. Yeah, I got placements, but then like to get to Eminem, that wasn't just me. I was working with amazing people that helped me get to that level. Right. You know because of what they brought to the table. You right, know, Jetty, Danny Key. I had all all kind of people that were just amazing at what they did, and we and we didn't think we weren't thinking. We were just creating every day, and that was like, I miss those moments because 
we didn't know what we were doing. And that's like the best time to create is when you don't really know where it's going. Right. You just make it. You know what I mean? Right. I have a friend who plays a uh, in a is an old time style of music where you you're kind of learning songs on the fly. So one person in the group knows the song and then everyone else is kind of chasing it, trying to figure it out. And they said to me yeah. one time that they said, I like my playing best when I don't yet know the song and I'm trying to kind of figure out where I fit into it. And sort of that, you know, that, that uncertainty and that, that chaos, you know, there is, there's enormous creativity and inspiration in chaos sometimes. So um, I want to give a shout out, by the way, I think I'm seeing, Illmind uh, is uh, in the Illmind, <laughs> legend, <laughs> legend. Yeah, that's my guy, dude. I'm still. I'm, I've been like harassing him for like the last ten years for this 2007 beat tape that he made. That is insane. Oh it's yeah, so crazy. Yeah, yeah. I'm, 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 I'm gonna hit him up. Because yeah, I man, that. you heard it here, man. <laughs> Let's get that beat tape out there. Get it to that's Khalil. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, thanks for thanks for joining us there in the chat, Illmind. Um, so. Let me take a look. There was another a question someone had about. Well, let me scroll up and see if I can find it again. Uh, there was a technical question. Someone was asking about the organs that you used on um, Roads of Perdition. Um, uh, they they specifically, for example, mentioned J Electronica. Yeah. So, Roads of Perdition. Yeah. What um, uh, what what are those? What's what's the deal with those organs? And what can you what can you tell them about them that maybe. Uh, so that's a great question because I, I really want to, I mean, not a lot of people know that song. Um, it's crazy. I love that record. But I did that with a Roland 3080 going through guitar rig. So there was a brass, it's like a brass patch going through, oh God, I can't, I, I'd have to pull it up. Like I'll probably like, posted you know one of these days but the chain that i had you know with with the brass the brass patch that i have coming out of the 3080 you know because it had like a an orchestral um card you know that had like strings and, and right. horns and stuff and the horns are great they sound great you know if you heard it by itself you'd be like oh, i don't know it kind of sounds dated now but when you run it through guitar rig the guitar rig added like a texture to it that made it sound like it was from an old record it just like made it more lo-fi or whatever whatever you want to call it right and and i remember um i was working with danny danny keys who played and i just i made the sound he played it and literally you know he played this melody and i was like oh my god that's so crazy I, like, I, that's like sounds like something i would find on a record and literally i chopped it up i made the beat that day but it's it's uh yeah it's not even an organ it's really a brass patch hmm. going through our rig like going through i forgot which amp it was it's like going through like an amp and in the amp they have a spring reverb so you turn the spring reverb up gotcha and that's, that's the sound that you got i know so, um when i talked uh, with key wayne i know he talked about automatic retro transformer for that same exact reason that he right. he uses it to degrade he'll play things in and then he'll degrade them so it feels like it came off a record and yeah yeah he's know. crazy I, I don't know what he's doing half the time <laughs> <laughs> But I mean, it's that it's it's the um, it's the mo in the modern era. It's like just just as much as the DAWs and the tools allow us to achieve sort of musical perfection. There's a sonic perfection that comes with a lot of these sample libraries and a lot of the plugins where it's like yeah. you kind of need to mess it up to get it to feel to get, right to again, feel, you know, to, especially for hip hop, because I feel like it can't be too clean. It can't be too perfect. Like hip hop, I always say like hip hop breaks all the rules of music in my opinion mm -hmm. you know I mean? stuff can be out of key but it still feels right, it right. Can, you know it could be and, and i feel like even when i listen to old stevie or whatever if you listen to like the individual stems it's like there's so many things out of key but it somehow it all works like i don't know what it is like even fela you can listen to those horns and all that stuff is out of key mm. but no one's in key it's like you know or or you know out of tune i'm sorry not in key out of tune yeah um and and to me that's like the magic because you get that like kind of like weird rub and you're going in between like he, you know it's it's something about that's why everybody's adding like the rc20 or you know the these types of plugin or cassette you know because it like it makes it makes you feel something like it sounds more analog and it sounds like it sounds more alive right it just sounds more alive 
Right. Right. Yeah. Um, there was a, there's another question uh, about sort of one of your uh, beat making processes, the Bishop yeah. Lamont city lights song. Um, okay. Curious, That's curious awesome. about your, your process for making that uh, Chiggs is asking. Yeah. Uh, that was the original, like the beat. I had the beat initially um, and I used like reason sounds and, um, and I made like a common air patch. And the cool thing about the common air patch, um, I used the subtractor, but I, I would, and then I used the um, RV 7000. Uh -huh. So I would stack two of those and one, and they would have like different presets on them. But then I put the gate on it and the gate would make it sound more like a chop. So when I would play it, it would cut off the sound and it would sound like it would sound like a chop. Like I, I took like a record and just chopped the keys. Huh. But it's actually me playing. So when you listen to that record, that's what you're hearing. And then I sent the beat to um, to Chin and Jetty, who I worked with. We, we were doing a, a bunch of stuff at the time. And, you know, I had a group called the New Royales. And he and Eric added the guitars and and the, uh, the hook and then sent it back. So they just sent me all the stems. And then I just kind of like arranged it and put it together. And, gotcha. Uh, Gotcha. Sent to Bishop, and sent to Bishop, and he was like, you know, and then it got placed in like a video game. I can't remember which one. Huh. But uh, yeah, I was doing a lot of video games back then. Oh yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was a growth industry for a while. Yeah. Um, yeah. there was a question. Uh, there's a couple of questions people are asking about your drums, um, and how you kind of get them to groove and swing the way you do. Um, and is that? I guess that's. Uh, the, the, there's one particular question. Uh, Black Hal Seven asks, "How do you get it to swing in reason like that?" But I imagine the swing isn't necessarily dependent on just reason, because you get them to swing the w and groove in in Ableton as well, or or in uh, with some of your NI packs and stuff like that, right? It's different. I mean, I feel like each DAW is different. Um, like, what if I could show? But I mean, it, like with. Uh, like I have my um, expansion up here. It's like my expansion, like, like my 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 swing in Ableton is completely different than my swing in Reason. And I feel like there's like a split second, um, a, you know, a split second delay in Ableton that I don't have in Reason. Like mm. Reason, as soon as I hit the keys, it's like right on. So that's closer to like what I was doing on the ASR10 than. With Ableton, I feel like I have to kind of like nudge or I have to do it a couple of times to actually, it's like a different feel. Um, I wish I could like open up Reason right now, but I'm still in Ableton. But, um, but it's just, I practice. Like I literally just make drum tracks. I'll, I'll sit and make drum tracks all day. Um, let me see if I can get this to work. Um, hopefully Shane, this Shane work. Thompson says it's the best NI expansion ever, so. There you go. Shout out wow. from Shane. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Shane. I appreciate it. Um, uh, <clears throat> I'm going to see if I can get this to work. Maybe I can. And it's all, I just play it in. I don't, you know, I, I know a lot of people draw, draw stuff in. Yeah. Um, but but so me, I think that is probably, you know, the, the, the real direct answer in, in some ways for, for Black House 7 is that your groove is, it's, it's because it's your groove. It's not coming yeah. from a, a template or something. I studied a lot of Jay Dilla. I mean, even high tech, like I used to listen to a lot of high tech, you know, um, Mr. Porter, like everybody, like, you know, Dilla was like the first to me that had that kind of like swing unquantized thing. And I was just like, man, that just sounds so good. Like it just feels so good and how he plays is. So it's like, you're creating a groove that feels more human than just like staying on the grid. So like, I'll just do one real quick, just to see if you can do one, if you don't mind. No, I don't mind. Right. 
So I always have like addictive drums or something just for like hi hats. So, and I put screen four, there it is right there. And I, I'll put it on like addictive, right? And I'll, I'll use Oh, I see, this, it so. just has an audio effect. Yeah, it just has an audio effect. So it just like, so this is, right? That's with scream on, this is with it off. <laughs> the scream on it. Like, look, I mean, oh, that just, my God. Dirt, just sounds so amazing already. It just sounds dirty. Right? So then I'll just, like, and I'll, I'll literally make, like, 10 tracks like this and just make drums. Sometimes I won't even make beats. I'll just make drums. Or just, or maybe I'll make the drums and then maybe put one sample to it and move on. You Il, know, Ilmine just, says I'll, it's I'll, already I'll, fire. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Ilmai. Let me switch that hi hat. See, I, I don't like that hi hat, so let me switch that out. And that's the thing about I I've really been digging into um We'll try that. So huh. I'll just loop that. And now no quantizing. Right. And what's interesting to me is that when the click was on, it felt like it was pushing and pulling on the beat. But when you take the click out, suddenly it is it the feel is is there with the two two different tracks, yeah. you know? Right. And like sometimes I'll have to keep doing it over and over again to get it right because when you get to the end the loop isn't always falling back on the one. So like you'll hear it, it'll, it'll, there'll be like a, a slight pause. You know oh, what right. I'm saying? Right, right. So, so I have to kind of, I can like nudge it or maybe sometimes I'll quantize it a little bit just to see. And it's different in here than it is in reason for me. Yeah. So, So you're saying when you're doing this in reason, the the kind of the the response is a little faster and more direct to how you're feeling it. Yeah, totally. Like I, I feel like, um, I feel like, you know, as soon as I hit the key, it's like it responds. Right. So you know, if, if I was like on an MP or whatever, just like analog, any analog, you know, hardware, as soon as I hit the key, it's gonna respond. Where in here, I feel like it's a, it's like a you can't really hear it but it's like i feel it it's just the feel of it yeah right right well i remember I think, in the er like, early days of um pro tools i remember people that were coming up on the you know the old atari sequencers they used to all have that i, I don't i guess you could call it a complaint at pro tools but you know uh, they were saying yeah. that the clock in on the atari sequencer in the 90s was so direct that they missed it right. when they kind of moved over to to the other yeah. stuff yeah and it's you know and it's just it's also depends on like how the kick is hitting, you know, it, the kicks hit a little bit different in reason they do in Ableton. It's just, they're just, it's not like one is better than the other, but for like hip hop, I want to hear that punch immediately. Cause like when I listen to Premiere, I listen to any of my favorites, that punch is everything. Yeah. You know, yeah. That, that's, that's where you get the bounce. So you kind of want to have that. So then like, I'll, you know, from there, I'll just like layer like a, um, I have like hi-hat loops that I'll just put on. Right, so that just adds like some very huh. Now I still have that. I still have that like little pause, but I'm just so you've got you've got three track. I mean, all three tracks are using hi hats, right? Except for except for this. Oh, is that bottom one just kick and snare? Oh, it is, isn't it? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Okay, yeah. okay, gotcha. Yep. Yeah. And, you know, with, with the expansion, like I'm using the Fairfax kit, like I'll turn the velocity 
all the way to zero and then I'll mess with the volume envelope to like take some of the decay off of some of the sounds just to make it a little more punchy and cut a little bit better and then you know I'll go you know from here it's like I have like a basic see I start with drums I know most people start with the loop first uh-huh which is like that's just the way people do it now but I'm I just like to have the the groove before because that kind of inspires like what sample I'm going to use right you know, starting just starting with just the music and building around it I feel like I, I can't I it just doesn't sound like me basically sounds, right just, um a comment so, you know, from Obi Bur Rio, I might be saying that wrong, says, I don't use Scream 4 enough, to be honest. I'll be using it more on drums. Really brings out the color. Yeah, I, I think that's a, your, yeah, your that's, example there was a very powerful example. It's, it is the secret weapon. Like it, it's, it, for, for hi-hats and snares, that is the color because you can literally bring out certain frequencies that you just don't even know that, that are there. Is your, can we you pop it up for a second? What, what sure. um, mode of Scream 4 are you Using. It's literally just the initial patch, and I what I do is it's on overdrive. Okay, I don't know if you can see that the damage uh, control. Yeah, twelve noon. Is, yeah, and then like what I do is like this kind of determines whether it how dirty it is. So right, that muddies it, this brightens it a little. Oh, bit. I see. Right, sometimes like maybe I'll if I want it to sound real raw, I'll go to fuzz. So you know you have all these different. See, that makes it a little bit more tight, you know? Yeah. But it's still lo-fi. It's, it's like a ring modulator that's on it. But I like using overdrive because it's just, it's just cut, you know, it's like, it's literally easy. And then sometimes- that, And that makes sense it. that that is sort of the color generator because that is effectively what yeah. an overdrive is doing, at least on a guitar pedal board, so. Yeah, so um, I use Screen 4 for drums and samples. Like, it colors gotcha. sound like, like no other, I feel like no other. <laughs> Okay. Stefan in Stockholm is telling us, uh, telling everyone to quick take a screenshot of your Screen Four settings. So they can... <laughs> it's like the most vanilla settings, but it just does. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty. It's pretty basic. Um, but you but, know, you can you can dig into it. There's like some cool stuff. I do want to show you. Let me show you this other thing. Too. Yeah, cool. <laughs> So this this is just like a sample that I made with that Cordimus plugin. Oh, you oh the the Cordimus that you showed us earlier, you made this sample. Yeah, well this yeah so I well I use Cordimus to make this sample. It's not exactly the one that I was doing earlier. Yeah, 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 this, right, right. And are is, those are those reason instruments then that were? Yeah, playing? so I can show you. I use a lot of the jiggery pokery, um, uh, you know, rack extensions. And they have a harpsichord that is incredible. Huh. All, all their stuff is incredible, but the harpsichord is amazing. So, like, you, so that's like a combination of like the radical piano. Radical piano and the harpsichord together. Can you? So you is it possible? Is it still in this uh, file? You can, you can pop it open, or uh, let me see if I have that particular. I don't know if I do, but oh, you know, I right. can make. It, I can make it real quick. It's not that. It's not that hard. That way, I can show how it's made. I'm sure uh, Jiggery Pokery will be thrilled to know that they're uh, <laughs> getting I, the love from you. I try. I, I I try all the rack. I'll just do the trial on like a lot of rack extensions, and their stuff is perfect because it's lo-fi, but it's it's just it sounds like it's just magic. It just sounds dope. You know, it has that like dirty like sample quality. Right. To it. Wow. That is a cool because it's not like a when you said harpsichord, I was thinking like kind of the classic like Mozart kind of harpsichord, right? Like even like with these two chords, like this is this is dope for like an idea, right? Like uh, 
right? That's already a vibe, you know what I mean? <laughs> so, now, so now, like, I can start adding stuff on top of it. So like stuff like that. And then the cool thing about Ableton is that everything that you play like records and things like that. But but you know what I mean? Like I can just start layering on top of that, um, adding more, you know, like bass sounds. Yeah, yeah, right. That's what so now the the comments are lighting up with people that are uh, I think they're in, involuntarily collabing now with you We're like and now add a thick 808 and and now out of this <laughs> <laughs> put a melody on that yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah this, this part of the process takes forever for me because like i'm i'm like you know i normally have bass players so right. i can play i can play bass lines and i'm i'm cool but i really love live bass yeah or or you, yeah, you could definitely add eight away for sure. But bass players, um, bass players think differently than I think all of us do. You know, they just yeah, you know, yeah. They come at the beat from a different perspective. Right. There's a comment I, th I laughed at from Vic Ocho says, "I just want to sit in a session. I won't say a word, and I'll leave my <laughs> phone in the car." Oh, <laughs> uh, you and me both, Vic. I think uh, <laughs> we we can set up like a one way mirror. You won't even know we're there. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh um let me take a look and see them grab some other uh, comments here and then yeah. i i gotta i don't want to take up your entire day here so oh, we'll, uh, we'll 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 get let you go um but um oh there was a question about i thought this was a good question they're asking the here's a question i think what they're asking is uh, I'll, I'll say it later um when you produce a track do you also provide the concept and i think what they mean is do you have a concept maybe a song content concept in mind when you're making a beat and do you then suggest that to an artist or do you let it them depends. run with it? It depends on the artist. Um, because when you work with artists, they, they have a certain vision of what they want to do. I mean, sometimes if you have a vision for them, you know, and they're open to it, it's really about whether they're open to it. But most artists that I work with, they have a vision of what they want to say on a, a particular album. So within that context, I can, you know, suggest certain things. But, you know, when you work with like, you know, big, you know, a, a person like Big Crit, for example, like um, he kind of knows, like he kind of knows what he wants to say or he wants to do or like Eminem has a clear vision of what he of what he wants to do. Like, right. When we, worked on, when we worked on recovery, just it just happened that what I was doing just fell in line with what he was trying to do. Mm. You know what I mean? Where it was like the the songs that I sent him already had the hooks on there. Right. And he was like, this is exactly like where I'm at, you know, um, emotionally or whatever. And this is what he was trying to say. That was the statement at the time. And it just fell into his project. Huh. Um, and I was just in this very like super influenced by Rick Rubin. So I was really like into the rock, hip hop, you know, like, big production because just because like i love ll cool j i love all the stuff that he had done run dmc all those all it's those amazing yeah records. yeah i mean you know that's just and i you know it was like provide providing that backdrop for like somebody like eminem like he he but he had a vision so it was like i i pitched the concept because the hooks were already on there and you know he could have been like nah that's not that's not it but it just kind of fell in line so it varies from each artist there's, there's never like I got a concept for every artist I work with. That's not really how I work. I, I like to let them have their right their space, and if they're having problems with it, that's when I step in. Gotcha. There was a, a story um, a producer once told me. He was a he, he's a producer named Guy Sigsworth that's done a bunch of you know a bunch of pop stuff. So he he did an Alanis Morissette record. He did a Britney Spears record. He and right. he did a Madonna record uh, back in the sort of early two thousands. And on that record. He, he had a particular song. He had made this instrumental and he got word from Madonna's label that she was seeking songs. And so he sent just this instrumental to her. But at the top of it, he put a little sample from a movie of a, it's a line of dialogue where this woman says, I bet secretly 
you've always wondered what it feels like to be a girl. And he knew that just putting that would be that little thing he's like that would get her gears turning. Right. Right. And right. sure enough, she wrote this whole song. It's called What It Feels Like for a Girl. And like right. and and he just he drew it was like the bait on the line to like kind of pour yeah. in. He didn't tell her what he wanted her to write about, yeah. but it just kind of set that little seed, you that's know. The, that's the that's the trick when you're a producer. You have to every artist is different and you don't want you know every artist has an ego as well you mm. know so you want to you want to understand who you're dealing with i mean i've seen dre do it i've seen some of the greats do it where it's just like they understand the artists that they're working with and they know how to kind of maneuver around them and some artists just want to be told they just want to be like okay what do you think what do you want me to do they'll tell you for the most part mm. but in my experience i i like to let them figure out what they want to do and even if it's a bad idea sometimes doing a bad idea leads to a great idea hmm. because if i'm like i'm not really feeling this you could kill the whole session the whole vibe of working with somebody just because you're like this is whack i don't like it no okay we'll do it i'll buy in let's see what and then they'll get to a point where they're like nah this isn't working is it and i'll be like well let's try why don't we try this and then they'll be open to it because I let them kind of lead. I trusted their Wow. Region. Now it's now it's now I can kind of chime in and say, okay, maybe let's try this. Maybe this will be cool. And they'll be like, okay, cool. Let's do it. If you shut it down, then they kind of shut you down. Like, nah, I'm, I'm good. You know right. I mean? You, you kind of have to dance around it a little bit and understand who you're dealing with as an artist. What a great, what a great piece of advice. Though I have to imagine that there's probably a little bit more of a trick to that than then maybe even you realize because yeah. the the flip side to that is that the other thing that will kill a sort of creative vibe is when someone's aware that you actually aren't feeling their idea and you're bullshitting them right yeah. so yeah. so there is a it, what it seems like to me is that you even if you're not feeling it you kind of probably have to genuinely be rooting for the idea you want it to succeed yeah you want no you don't want to kill the idea i'm i am like you want to go there let's do it you know what I mean? Unless it's just something I'm like, no, this is definitely not going to, you know? <laughs> but, like, for the most part, it's it's better to try because you never know where that idea will lead you. That idea could lead you to the best idea you've ever done with that artist, <clears throat> period. So sometimes it's cool, even, like, when you make beats. Like, you, I could sit down and make three whack beats in a row and be like, man, I'm so whack. But then you, like, for some reason, maybe you discover something on the third beat that you're like, man, okay, I didn't even, okay, let me try that on this next one. And you stumble on something new. Like, it's really the, the journey of going through, like, the bad ideas to get to the good ones. Right. You know, so sometimes with artists, you have, you have to be open. It's just, it's just about being open. And not, like, like I said before, like, you have to be open to the possibilities. Because even if this idea I think is bad, it might end up being amazing. You know what I mean? I may, I may be wrong. You know, I may be like, okay, damn, I didn't see that. And, you know, I, I go with it. And so it's really just about being open um, to whatever ideas. You know, it's it's literally like, I feel like it's always going to lead to somewhere positive as long as you are open with them and they you kind of get their trust. There's an interesting balance there because you're, you know, uh, you've talked a lot about um, sort of navigating and working with um, and, and I don't say this in a bad way, ego, ego in a good way, right? Artists have a certain yeah. ego, producers or, yeah. or, you know, people have a certain ego. But then the counterbalance to that is you're also talking about exercising this really good blend of modesty and, and being humble. And so being humble to maybe I don't know the best idea or maybe yeah. I should bring in this guy because he's going to actually add something I can't to this this beat. And sort of yeah. and, and and then then you go back and i'm sort of seeing it like a scale thing like then also you're talking about you know it sort of is your own ego and again not in a bad way good the good ego that keeps you confident that if you've made three whack beats that doesn't mean you should just give up for the night and you know or oh. quit the business or whatever right like oh that, because i mean the more I, the more you work i mean i put in the time i put in the time to get to a point where i know i'm good because i've worked with you know what i mean i've worked with some of the and and I mean Dr. Dre is my mentor. That's like my big brother. And you can't walk in a room and wow Dr. Dre. That rarely happens. You right. know what I'm saying? I've you know, I can actually say I've done that where he was like, yo, like this is crazy. Or you get the thumbs up. When he gives you the thumbs up, you know you're good. <laughs> so it's like 
that gives you com that gives you confidence in your sound and your vision or or whatever that is. So, and I listen to a lot of music. I'm confident in my and what I have to say musically. So, yeah. I, you know, I, I know that what I do works. What, whatever that is, like whether it makes hits or not, it doesn't really matter. It works. It it works for for expression's sake. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I'm I really try to. I don't really get caught up in ego or whatever it's not it's not about me if i work with the artist it's about them they have to perform it for the rest of their lives it's not it, i can walk away and work on the next record right so so when, when i work with the artist i'm like especially if we're working on a full project i'm like look the key that i don't i don't have to perform this this is you have to be happy with this at, at the end of the day it's not about me and i think like most producers that are incredible get that it's it isn't about them it's about the artist you have to put the artist first it's not about my ego it's not about my taste all the time i mean it is about it but because i have to guide it but i have to i have to have your best interest in mind not right. mine right you know what i mean there is a parallel um you know in my my coming from the the film and and sort of video production side of things there's this parallel idea that when you're when you're on a set of any kind big or small big movie small documentary, whatever it is, you know, yeah. there is the, there's the director that would be kind of the artist parallel in some ways in this, in music. And like you, everyone else's job is to make sure that, that, that the director succeeds and you do everything you can to, to sort of just like, you don't, you don't start getting into like, Oh, I know better or, Oh, they should do this. It's like the right. minute, once you're working together, it's like, it is all about that group effort for the, for the greater it's good. The yeah. It's about the greater good. It's about, it's about the end result. It's like we have to produ produce the result. Yeah. At the end of the day, so I can't, I can't put push my ego f in, into it. it. It has to be about the best result. What gets the best result? I'm willing to do whatever to get the best result. Right. Even, even if, even if I'm taking a minimal role in what's happening, I will do it because it's not about me. It's about the creative people that are in the room that are feeling a vibe. And me trying to insert myself into something that's already working doesn't even make sense. It's like, let let the people do what they do. And at the end, that's when I come in like, okay, cool. You know, this sounds great. Maybe we should change this. Maybe this needs to be simplified. And I'm still learning this. Like this yeah. is, you know, I read a book by Phil Ramone called Making Records, Changed My Life. Hmm. Change, I have the biggest record of, of my career I, I had after I read that book. And if I didn't, if I hadn't read that book, I probably would have lost the, the job that I was doing. I was working with Aloe Black, and I did the whole album, got nominated for a Grammy. Uh, the Man was a top 10 record on Billboard Hot 100, you know, was in a huge Beats campaign. All, you know, it, it was huge, a huge, huge record. Yeah. Um, but had, if I didn't read that book, I wouldn't have gotten that job because I didn't really understand. He He painted the what a producer does to me in, in a way that I didn't really know that, okay, I get it now. I get what my role is in this context. And what and when I when I talked to Aloe the first time, the first few times we met, I said, I was like, look, man, this is about you. This is about what you want to perform and what you want to say. And I want you to be able to perform these songs for the rest of your life. And we ended up doing one of his biggest song biggest records, the man. So you know, the fact that I was, I put it out there that I'm being selfless, it's not about me, uh -huh. already got, got me the job. He was like, you're, you're my guy. Because everybody, everybody else that I work with was telling me what I needed to do and what I needed to be. You're actually open to what I, you know, to wow. what my vision is. What a cool, so, I mean, you know, like the, the, the circle of that, the, the, like, the fact that you set out to, with the mindset of like, he's got a play this song. He's the guy that he's going to live with the song for the rest of his life. And he's got to, you know, play it and, and, and love it and yep. whatever. And, and so you approach the work with that way. And what a kind of cool thing that like, I mean, the man is a tune that he will do for the rest of his career when he plays live or whatever, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It, and, and, um, it out all the time and, you know, that is, that it's, is so cool. So that book's called Phil, it's Phil Ramone and it's called making records. Called making records. That is and like any producer, every producer should buy that buy that book it's i mean incredible. i'm I, i'm guys you heard it here first like i'm after <laughs> the stream 
I'm ordering the book. I hope everyone else is. We can do like like Oprah's book club. We'll do Khalil's book club, and we'll, <laughs> we'll just all all read that book together, man. Yeah. Um, yeah. IQ Music says, did he write or read the book? No, he read the book. Uh, yeah, Phil Ramone. So yeah, yeah um, I read it. I, I didn't write it. It's, it's about Phil. Phil Ramone's a producer. He worked with Frank Sinatra. He worked with uh, oh my gosh, um, uh, Paul Simon, Barbara Streisand. I mean, hmm. he, you know, I mean, like a classic. You know, he's just like he's like Quincy Jones. He's like you know in the in that right. You know, on, on that level, and. Um, and he's produced iconic records, you know what I mean? So um, I, I I learned about it through a friend of mine. He, you know, I was in like Vancouver and he had it and I was like, what is this? And he was like, dude, you should get that book. Like, you know, like just, I read the first chapter. It was by, about Frank Sinatra. And I was like, even it was about capturing the moment, literally. Yeah. And I was like blown away. I was like, I'm buying this book. So I bought it on my phone and, um, and I just read it. I read it on my phone and I was just like, it changed, it transformed. It, it, I, I feel like it just changed everything about how I approach making music. Literally. Wow. That's quite an yeah. endorsement. And you, I mean, you were well into your career at that point too. I mean, this is not, oh, totally. was it 2012 yeah. or something or 11 or? Yeah. 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 This was like 2011, 2012. I mean, but I was making a transition from being a hip hop producer into going into like, you know, working in R and B and pop. I worked with Pink on her album. You right. Know, I was actually in the studio with her, working with her and, and like that's what I'm saying. Like, you know, when you read and you read about these different stories and understanding like the situations you're going into, you know, uh it's like it's it's vital information because you could literally say something dumb or something stupid and literally blow your chances of working with that person ever again hmm. you know what i mean just because you don't know you just don't know how to conduct a session you don't know how to you know the psyche of an artist especially a big artist yeah you know what I mean? so um it's really just about like re knowing how to read the room and knowing how to get the result how to get the result um that's like that's the key you know that's the key that book is it's pretty it's pretty incredible I mean, I read, I read a lot of other books, you know, I read like, you know, Quincy Jones, I've read yeah. um, Clinton's, you know, um, Maurice White, like just all these, you know, icon icons. Yeah. Uh, but his book like really, you know, struck a, a, a nerve with me or whatever, you know. That so is incredible. Like, well, I, I'm, we're coming up on a, the two hour mark of going live. So we're going to, we're going to wrap things up here, but let me just see, I, there was a couple of reason related questions that I. I thought we, yeah. we kind of covered some of them. People are asking, what are some of your favorite rack extensions? You mentioned the jiggery pokery stuff. Um, yeah. Related to I that, know. someone had asked whether you whether you mess around with grain. Grain, uh, not really. No. Um, I mean, I, I've tried. I, I've, I haven't really figured out how I would use it because – like those grain kind of like it's, it's, it's dope. It's one of those ones where when for some people it clicks and for some people it it doesn't. And you know, there's a yeah. there's this uh, producer Light Seconds uh, who's done huge records with Dua Lipa and The Weeknd and all sorts of people. And uh, he, uh, me and Stefan actually visited him uh, in Stockholm, and he was like, I. I only use grain now. We're like, really? Only? He's like, yeah. Grain is my sampler. Grain is my synth. Grain is my wow. effects. Grain is, and it was like, what? And he showed us, and he really, really was using it that way. So, That's yeah, incredible. It. I mean, I'll show you this. This is another like, this this thing is is incredible. Um, so like with this, like this sample. Yeah. Right. So jiggery pokery makes this thing called Villanelle. I guess that's what it's called killer Y. so i'll use that and so like you can kind of hear it right but then you add the pulsar dual lfo to it flip the on the back and like take the Y cv in to the l you know and attach that to lfo yep and so now it'll give you like this cool Y effect right and then oh, cool. you know from there it's like you can add like i i'll tell you what i love this sweeper modulation effect i think this is incredible this is 
that that's that thing is is amazing. Um, and even with that, like I like to start from scratch. Huh. You know, it's just the the textures of it. I mean. Um, You know what I mean? So that it's is like, the. Uh, I mean, yeah. That that's what you've just done in sort of thirty seconds. It so encapsulates the reason racks kind of like just hey, just drag in another thing. What is like, that another yeah. thing? You know? That's, yeah, yeah. It's. It, I mean, you, you know, you could just keep going. You know, and then like, what I'll do is I'll just save this as a patch. You know what I mean? I'll right. Just, like, grab all these, and then just like, um, create a combinator, combine. Bam, save it. You know what I mean? Save right. That as, a, as a sound, so I could just recall it, and then I'll put it in my like my Ableton patches, and like I could just recall it, like just save it as an Ableton. And do you um, because you said that you you sort of move back and forth between the Reason Rack plugin and then sometimes the Reason DAW as well. Do you uh, so you have a, a shared library of combinators because they'll open in both. I I think, unless I'm yeah, wrong. Yeah, they'll open. Yeah, yeah. Like uh, what I do is um. I save the patches like if I make patches in Ableton, I'll just save it as an Ableton, you know, whatever, like a um, just like an Ableton patch, I guess. And um, so then it just it just recalls like that instead of like trying to go into my combinator. Oh, we can, I see. Right, right, right. You know, it's just it's a lot easier to drag and drop in here. Um, and then like if you look in my browser, then you'll see like all my combinator patches already kind of like categorize and all that kind of stuff gotcha so, so Very I, I try cool. to organize things in that way yeah that's really cool well listen i i'm gonna let uh you go and i'm gonna let uh, our audience go i'm probably speaking for everyone in the audience that says that if we could somehow engineer a way for us to spend the next 14 hours hearing uh <laughs> knowledge from you because i think there's there's stuff on here that i'm going to be thinking about for the rest of the day not to mention right. ordering that book um, right. <laughs> it has been such a pleasure having you on, Khalil. I really appreciate Thank you, you uh, joining us. And um, I hope we can do more and uh, more stuff and soon, you know, let's uh, yeah. hopefully we can keep the keep the collab going here but um i, I yeah i just want to thank you from everyone who d can't say it directly how much they've thank enjoyed in fact <laughs> people now are like, jay pistol's going no it's ending <laughs> and if you don't have the expansion please look out for the expansion the artist expansion with native instruments yeah 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 you yeah you guys you were doing was it a promo you were doing the other day or something or was that a, a new release an update or uh no uh um, something where you no, were not Maybe it was just a social no, yeah. campaign. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I yeah, got gotcha. you. Oh, no, that was, yeah, that was for, um, I work with uh, a nonprofit that my mom. Oh, okay. Had, yeah, uh, called Yes to Jobs, and I work with them, and, you know, helping them kind of, they're re they just relaunched, so I've, I've been working with them. I got gotcha. you. Yeah. I got gotcha. you. So, cool. Um, well, hey, listen, I wonder, could I, I wonder if I could put in a request that uh, the beat that you got going up there, if we yeah. set up a loop, could you provide us some outro music uh, for the stream here and uh, with uh, <laughs> running that loop? And then uh, did you add, you had some like melody you were uh, doing over top of yeah, it and yeah, stuff too? Yeah. Okay. Yep. I'm going to, I'm going to say goodbye to everyone on the stream here, but uh, you get us a beat going. <laughs> All right, guys, listen, a huge thanks to our guest DJ Khalil today. I want everyone to re-watch this stream, like, because there's so much in it that you need to, 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 like, digest and learn from. So, that's all of our homework. We're going to re-watch the stream. We're going to order that book, Phil Ramone Making Records. And I'm going to see you next week. Let me, let me actually give you guys, while, while Khalil gives us the beat there. Let me just give you a little uh, update here. Next week, we have our 20th episode. And for our 20th episode, I want to have you guys on again. We did a big Zoom call. I want you guys to come on and show me the music you've been making. I want to talk about what you've been doing during our, our last five and a half months. So get ready for that. Tune in next week. Join me on the stream. I'm going to send out a Zoom link. 
and you guys are going to be the guest. We're going to talk about your music. We're going to do some show and tell. We're all going to get inspired. If you can imagine, as inspired as we got today, thanks to DJ Cleo, and we will see you guys next week on Your Reason to Stay Inside.